This is what it says. All things are possible when we believe old chains are breakable. When we receive Yahweh, you keep your promises. If you said it, we believe it. If you said it, hey, if you said it, we believe it.
Hello everyone and welcome to Church Online Today. My name is Emmanuel Robinson and I serve as a Connections Pastor here at the Capitol Church. Thank you so much for joining us. However you connect with us, hey, we would love if you took a couple of seconds right now to fill out a connection card. You can go to our website at thecapitalchurch.org slash connect. Why don't you also take a second and invite someone to watch church with you today. God is on the move and today is a very special weekend for you to join us. So right now we're about to go into a time of worship with Pastor Robbie and then we will hear a powerful message from Dr. Ryan Jackson. So go ahead, get your family together and let's worship God together. Praise the Lord everybody. We're so excited to worship with you today. Why don't you come on in and let's just hang out for a moment, all right? All around the world, we're going to talk about how good our God is. Hands up, come on. You are great, you are mighty, and we just want to worship and honor you today. 
Let's sing together. I know you know this song. Let's sing. Lord, you are good and your mercy endure it forever. Yeah. Let's sing it again. Say, Lord, you are good. People from every nation. People from every nation and tongue. From generations to generation, we words. Come on. Hallelujah. In your home. Come on, raise it high. Shut you for who you are. Sing it again. We worship you. Whoa, whoa. Say hallelujah. Come on, make a joyful noise. Clap those hands on you people. Let's give him a shout. Let's dance in his presence. He's so worthy of the praise. Let's take it again. Come on. Say, Lord, you are good. Mercy enduring. Sing it again. Say, Lord, you are good. People from every nation and people from every yeah, come on, from generation, we worship you. We say hallelujah, hallelujah. We worship you. You are great in our lives. You are Father and King. We worship you. You're awesome, Jesus. Hallelujah. We worship you. But who are you? All right, I'm going to give you 20 seconds. Let's just do it. Worship him. Come on. Praise him as loud as you can. Wake up your neighbors. Let them know that your God is a mighty God. Come on. Let's sing. Say, you are good all the time. All the time. Even right now, no matter what. Come on. You are good, say. And all the time, sing it again, say you are, you are good, all the time, yeah. Let the enemy know that our God is faithful in everything that he does. Hallelujah. Just put your hands like this, come on. Praise him stronger and stronger. Lift your hands and sing, Lord. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. Yes, you are. You're faithful, Jesus. We praise you, Lord. Sing it again. Say, Lord, you are good. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, Lord, you are good. Let's do it. People from every nation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's sing together. We worship. We worship you. Yeah. We worship for who you are. Let the nations declare His greatness. Come on. We worship. We love you, Jesus. Thankful, mighty redeemer. You are excellent. Awesome God you are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you are good. Hallelujah. Let's give God a praise right where you are. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for what he's done on the cross for us. We can never repay him. For the nails in his hands, the nails in his feet. But our heart says we're grateful. We're so thankful. Hallelujah. And there's a place where mercy reigns and never dies. 
There's a place where streams of grace, hallelujah, flows deep and wide. Where all the love I've ever found comes like a flood, comes flowing. Sing at the cross, at the cross, I surrender my life. I'm in all of you, hallelujah. I'm in all of you, and where your love went, and my sins was white. Oh, I owe it all to you. Oh, thankful for Jesus. Let's declare it now. Yeah. And there's a place where sin and shame are powerless. Hallelujah. And where my heart has peace with God and all of His forgiveness Hallelujah, Jesus. Where all your love I never found comes like a flood, comes falling down. Let's sing together at the cross. At the cross. At the cross. Hey. We're thankful, Jesus. Because of your love, I'm in awe of your grace, God. Where your love ran away, and all of our sins are washed white, God. I owe it all to you. Let's declare over our lives. Come on, here, saying, Here, my hope is found here on holy ground, and here I bow down. I bow down to you, Jesus. Oh, you saved my life. Come on, will you join with me? Let's raise that one more time. Say, here my hope is found. Here on the holy ground. Here I bow down before you, Jesus. Whoa. You stay alive. Oh, you're grateful. Oh, you're grateful. We say at the cross, at the cross, I surrender my life. I'm in awe of you. Yeah. Come on, are you in awe of him? Where your love and my sins. Hallelujah. I I owe it all to you, God. Come on, right where you are. I want you to begin to think about grace, about mercy, and about every time where you should have got what you deserved. But God stepped in, Son Jesus Christ, that you may live and not die. Come on, let me, let me hear you all over this world. Lift your voice, worship him. He's faithful. He's faithful, yeah. Oh, we worship you, Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. Oh, you're worthy, Jesus. You're worthy, Jesus. You're worthy, Jesus. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burdens of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight And now I am happy all the day Hallelujah
at the cross. Wow, what a powerful reminder that Jesus is truly all we need in our life. When it seems like our life is getting chaotic and there's no place to turn, we can continue to run back to our Heavenly Father. Hey, let me just tell you that God is here today. We are able to experience Him right there where you are through worship and the message that we are about to hear from Pastor Ryan. Because God has been so faithful to us, to the ministry of the Capital Church. The ministry of the Capital Church is still going forth, literally, all over the world. And if you would like to give to support what God is doing here, and if you would like to give today in your tithes and offerings, then you can go to our website at thecapitalchurch.org slash give. There, you can find a set of easy steps to help you in your online giving. You know, can't you attest to God's mercy and His grace into our life? It extends to us exactly where we are. Matthew 10 verse 8, it says, Freely you have received and freely give. God pushes us to get closer to Jesus, which causes us to trust Him in ways that really we might not initially understand. And so you can give today through our website at thecapitalchurch.org slash give. Hey, well, right now we're about to go into a message with Pastor Ryan that is going to change and transform your life. So go ahead, get your family together, go ahead and get your notebook and your Bible out, and let's experience God right now through His Word. Hello, Capital Church family. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're so glad that you're on this stream. I'm excited about sharing the Word with you today, and I'm excited because we're coming to the end of the time when our buildings have had to be closed. And uh, we'll keep you updated on that. So please stay tuned. We'll be uh, communicating with you over the next week or so. And and, uh, we're keeping our ear to the ground to hear what the decisions are coming down from the healthcare professionals and those kinds of things. And so we'll be informing you of a a further plan. Some of you maybe haven't accessed uh, uh, my Wednesday night session from last week. If you want to do that, uh, you can get on, and I gave a PowerPoint presentation that kind of explains our approach, and uh, so I point you towards that if you haven't had a chance. And hey, listen, if you're here and you're watching the stream, I would encourage you, why don't you just uh, send a text? Why don't you just get on and invite somebody to a virtual watch party? Uh, this is a wonderful opportunity to invite somebody to hear about uh, what we're saying from the Word of God today. So uh, I would encourage you to do that, and I pray you and your family are well. I want you to know that we as a church family, we are praying for you. We are praying for your family. We're praying for your safety. We're praying for God's blessings on you. And we know that God is going to use this difficult time for your good, for His glory, for the blessing of His church. And we know God's going to bring good out of that for those who trust in Him. So uh, we pray that you're well and we look so forward to when we can see you all again face to face. Well, today is Pentecost Sunday, so I want to speak this morning from Acts chapter 1 and 2. So turn in your Bible to Acts chapter 2. I'm going to read that passage in your hearing in just a moment. Let's go to the Lord in prayer together and ask His blessings on this portion of our time together. Can you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank You so much for being with us. Thank You, Lord, so much for speaking to us, giving us Your Word. We ask You, O Lord, in the name of Jesus, speak from Your Word. Help us to hear what You have to say and change our lives as a result, we ask You. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen and Amen. Hope you've got those Bibles open to Acts chapter 2, and I'll read that passage for you in just a moment. In an old building in the industrial area of Los Angeles, uh, believers really from all over the world who were hungry for an encounter with God began meeting to seek the power of the Holy Spirit in their lives. From there, a mighty revival broke out from that inauspicious building on Azusa Street 114 years ago. And that revival spawned a movement that has swept around the globe to become the fastest growing and largest stream of Christianity in the world. That Pentecostal headwater is part of our spiritual heritage here at the Capitol Church. And because today is Pentecost Sunday, I'd like to take this opportunity to talk a bit what that, about what that really means for us. Pentecost was one of the three most important annual feasts celebrated in ancient Judaism. It was a commemoration of Moses being given the law, and it was a celebration of the first fruits of the harvest. That has some extraordinary significance because Jesus in his ministry established a new covenant, a time of God's new law. 
Jesus came to fulfill the promise of the prophet Jeremiah that God would establish a new covenant where he would inscribe the law not on tablets of stone, but on the human heart. And in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit became the first fruits of God's promise. In fact, Paul called the gift of God's Spirit a, a first installment meaning that the gift of the Holy Spirit was only a precursor, a down payment, if you will, to the fullness of God's presence that is to come. So I want to read this, this, uh, this time together from Acts chapter 2. I'm going to read Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. I'm really doing a study of Acts chapters 1 and 2, so you can examine those passages together. But I'm going to read in our hearing this, this morning or this evening, whenever it is that you're uh, engaging with us here, this passage from Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through uh, 13. So hear the word of the Lord. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came a, from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome? both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others said, They are filled with new wine. Now this is the word of the Lord from Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. And I want to talk to us in this time together about some characteristics of what, a, what Pentecost is all about. Today is Pentecost Sunday, and we are a Pentecostal church. It's part of our spiritual heritage. So I want to talk about what it means to be a Pentecostal church, why that's important for us. Now, this is not an exhaustive list, but these are evident in the most central texts of, of Pentecostal biblical theology from Acts 1 to 2. The first characteristic I want you to note is that Pentecost is about the continuation of the ministry of Jesus. Pentecost is about the continuation of the ministry of Jesus. Luke begins this second volume of his book about Jesus, namely the book of Acts, with, with these words in Acts chapter 1 verse 1. In the first book, O Theophilus, meaning in the Gospel of Luke, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. Luke, in his Gospel and in the book of Acts, addresses his work to a person named Theophilus. Now, we don't know anything about Theophilus except the meaning of his name. And his name means loved or lover of God. So Theophilus was a person who either loved God or one whom Luke was identifying as one who loved God or was loved by God. Here's the, here's the application to that. If you have any interest at all in learning more about God and His purpose for your life, then this writing, this book, the book of Acts, is for you. Luke says he had formerly written about all that Jesus began to do and teach. The implication is that what he's writing here in the book of Acts is what Jesus continues to do and teach. We should never miss the fact that the book of Acts isn't about the Holy Spirit as opposed to being about Jesus. It's really about Jesus and his work through the power of the Holy Spirit. You need to know today that the work of Jesus isn't just stuck in the pages of ancient history. The work of Jesus continues today. 
in thousands of churches all over the world that seek to embody the ministry of Jesus on earth, in millions of believers who seek to employ the teaching of Jesus in their lives, in individuals who have experienced the transforming power of Jesus for themselves, like the man who succeeded at his job but failed as a father and a husband. He found a way to bring healing to his family through the power of Jesus. Or like the one who faced depression and and found that Jesus offered them a pathway towards hope. Or maybe the person who had it all together on the outside, but felt they were broken and hurting on the inside, and they found their peace in Jesus. I want you to know that His work continues in my own life, too. In Him, I have found forgiveness when I needed it. I found peace when I couldn't find it anywhere else. And I found joy that is beyond anything you could find in this world. So being Pentecostal at its heart has to be about the continuation of the transforming power of Jesus in the world. Jesus wants the capital church to be a life-giving, transforming church. Pentecost didn't come just to excite us. <laughs> Pentecost came to transform us. And so the work of the Holy Spirit and the, the meaning of Pentecost, the reason we're here as a church is to continue the work of Jesus. The second thing I want you to notice about the the whole meaning of Pentecost is that we welcome power encounters with the Holy Spirit. I mean, that's what happened in the book of Acts. Jesus said to his disciples in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you uh, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. We believe in a personal encounter with the Holy Spirit. A personal encounter with God Himself. What that means is our faith is not just an intellectual thing. It isn't just a philosophy or or, or a social thing. Really, our faith is about encountering God. And you simply can't encounter God and walk away unchanged. Every person has a deep internal longing to meet Him, to fellowship with Him. And that encounter is what drives us. When we encounter the presence of God, extraordinary things happen. God gives supernatural gifts designed to aid us in doing His work and continuing His ministry. Uh, he, he, He does miracles in our midst. Miracles are not just confined to the pages of Scripture. But God still operates in the miraculous in ways we often don't understand, in ways we can't manipulate or control. He doesn't heal because we shout loudly. He doesn't do the miracle because we are demonstrative in our expressions. But He still does heal. He still does deliver. He still does set people free. He still changes lives. He is able to do what no human can. In fact, nothing is impossible for Him. So whenever and wherever we worship, we come with an expectancy that we're coming to meet the Lord and the power of His presence. That's so powerful, even during time of pandemic like we're in right now. Often I've heard people say, well, the church is closed. Please do not say the church is closed because the building is closed, but the church is still the community where where we encounter the presence of the Lord. Now granted, we all look forward to when we can worship Him together, but when we're not worshiping together, we can still have our personal Pentecost. We can still encounter the powerful presence of the Lord Himself. A third characteristic of Pentecostalism, according to the New Testament, is that it empowers us to be witnesses. Pentecost means, as a church, We are empowered to be witnesses. Now, what witnesses mean is that we testify to something. That means we don't draw attention to the manifestations. We don't draw attention to ourselves. We witness to Jesus. That is, 
being Pentecostal is all about seeking to live in a way that points people toward Jesus. Not a single one of us is perfect. We're all just imperfect people trying to point others to the place where we found life and the place where they can find life too. In fact, in the New Testament, the word witness comes from a Greek word, martus, which is where we get the English word martyr. Those who testify of Jesus have to be ready to put everything on the line for Him. So being Pentecostal for us means being empowered to be witnesses, being empowered to point people toward Jesus. The fourth characteristic I want you to jot down is that we should be missional. Pentecost inspires us towards mission. The Word told us that we would be His witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. You see, those cities and regions represent growing circles of influence. Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. We can never be just interested in what's happening right here. But we also don't disconnect what's happening here from what's happening there. What's happening here has to expand. And what we do there must begin here. That means that we don't do something different in mission that we do, uh, or in missions that we do actually right here. In other words, it's no use going around the world if we won't walk across the street to witness and testify of the goodness of Jesus and His power in our own lives. It calls us out of our comfort zones. It calls us into different cultures, but it also calls us into different places like just our neighbor's home across the street or or just to make friends with those who don't know God. You see, the church of Jesus Christ is not a geographical location. It's not a building. It's not really an institution. The church is meant to be a movement. Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. It's meant to go and keep on going. In fact, the book of Acts really just kind of stops it. It doesn't even have a real conclusion. If you go to the very end of the, of the book of Acts, you'll see it doesn't really kind of sum up what happened. And that's because the story is meant to continue. The movement is meant to carry on. We're not meant to kind of hold the fort and put down our stakes and, and, and try to just hold on until Jesus comes. We're meant to take ground for His glory. We're meant to share His light in the darkness. We're meant to advance His cause and His purpose in the world where we live and serve. The fifth characteristic I want you to note is that we are characterized by unity. By unity. Acts 2.1 says this, When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. The old King James translation says they were with one accord. What that really means is they didn't really agree about everything. They didn't have all the same ideas, but they kept the main things, the main things. And they didn't allow secondary issues to divide them. They were so enamored by the resurrection of Jesus. They were so focused on His power and His presence. They were so focused in their earnest prayer and worship that they didn't allow any division among them. <laughs> what could that mean for us? It means we won't agree about everything. It means we won't take the same approaches. It means we won't all have the same political positions. It means we won't all take the same stance on, on various issues. It means that even within the church, we might have different approaches and different ways we'd like to do things and different things we'd like to see happen and different ideas about how things should happen within the church. But the question for us is this, is there a way we could be so focused on what really matters, so focused on the glory of God, so focused on the presence of the risen Lord, so focused on glorifying Him and worshiping Him together that, that what really matters is right at the core of our experience, and none of that other stuff really does anymore. You know, we sometimes criticize the government, don't we, for being so partisan. But the same kinds of things happen in the church, and it's to our detriment. 
our unity testifies to Jesus' identity. So one of the characteristics of what it means to be Pentecostal is that we're, we should be marked by unity. If you find yourself out of unity, I didn't say you agreed with everything, but if you find yourself out of unity, I want to just urge you, I want, I want to just encourage you. If you find yourself constantly striving against uh, the, the things that are going on in your church, I, I just encourage you, find one you can support. Find one that you can get behind and love and, and, and be in unity because that's really the mark of a New Testament community. Not every community is going to agree. We understand that. But unity is a, it should be a mark of the presence of the Spirit among a group of believers. Another characteristic we need to note is that we are fueled we are fueled by prayer. <laughs> Jesus had instructed his disciples in Luke 24, 49 and in Acts 1, 4 to 5. He told his disciples as he is ascending back to heaven after his resurrection, he told them to go to Jerusalem and do two things. He didn't tell them to go and make a strategic plan. I believe in strategic planning. But that's not where Jesus started. He didn't tell them to go and, and, and canvas the city of Jerusalem. He didn't tell them to go door to door. He didn't even tell them to go preaching on the street. He told them to do two things. He said, wait. And he said, pray. You see, they were wanting to know the scintillating details of the future. They wanted to know how the world would end. They wanted answers. They wanted to see how the kingdom of God would be established but Jesus instructed them not to leave Jerusalem. In fact, not to do anything until they were endued with his power. I think that's a clarion call to us today to be the Pentecostal church of the 21st century. We have to be fueled by prayer. Our work should be fueled in the presence of the Lord by prayer. Our lives should be fueled by prayer. Some of us spend so many hours every day listening to radio or reading the news or watching the news on television and it just whips our soul up into a frenzy of anger and frustration and sometimes fear and anxiety when I, I believe that if we would spend even a fraction of that time bringing those matters to the Lord in prayer, He will meet us in that prayer moment and that will fuel our own transformation and it will fuel our mission in the world. Let's fuel our lives and our work and our church with the power of prayer. When we gather together as a staff or when the leaders of the church gather together, we begin every time with prayer and i just i just want to see the holy spirit of the living god take over everything that we do and fuel what we do so that what we accomplish is more than the sum of the parts we've got some smart businessmen in our community we've got some wise people we've got some people who know all kind of things but listen God is not really impressed with what we know or our resources. He's not impressed with our business. He's not impressed with our finances. He's not impressed with those things. What, what really tugs on the heartstrings of God, I believe, is would His people get on their face before Him and call out to Him in prayer. And when we do that, God will hear us from heaven. And the Word of God says He will heal our land. And so let's fuel our lives and our prayer and our ministry and our church with the power of prayer. That's what it really means to be Pentecostal. The next one is one that I think is rarely associated with Pentecostals, but, uh, but I want you to know it most certainly absolutely is. And, and it's, it's simply this, that they were grounded in the Word of God. They were grounded in the Word. In Acts chapter 1, verse 16, and in Acts chapter 2, verse 16, it's very interesting. Some, it's a little bit kind of almost in passing. Peter stands up in both cases, in, in, in Acts 1.16 and Acts 2.16. Peter, the kind of lead apostle, stands up. And what does he do in both of those cases? In Acts 1.16, he's explaining how they're going to take their next steps in appointing leadership. In Acts 2.16, he's about to preach the, the greatest sermon he ever preached, the Sermon on the Day of Pentecost. In both cases... 
Peter explains what is happening and interprets life through the power of the Word of God. In both of those instances, Peter stands up and he says, this is as it was in the Scripture. As the Scripture said, that's what's happening right now. The Word of God said, and this is what's happening, and this is what it means. That's what Peter did. He explained what was happening with the Word. Their experience, in other words, lined up with the Word of God. And they saw their experience as an outworking of the story of Scripture. So here's what I want to say to us. Let's stay in line with the Word of God. God doesn't intend to give you or me or anybody else any kind of revelation that will not be in line with His eternal Word. He says Himself that heaven and earth will pass away, but not a dot over an eye or a cross of a T of His Word will pass away. So we don't serve the Muslim God who, who can change His Word at will according to whatever His whatever His will is at the moment, we serve the God who, whose Word is eternal and forever the same yesterday, today, and forever. So all of our experience is in line with the Word. I want to live in line with the Word. I want you to live in line with the Word. And you know, really, that's, that's, the, that's really one of the core questions of discipleship. All of us have to ask the question in our walk with the Lord, whether or not we will surrender to the authority of God's Word in our lives. Are we going to make the choice in our lives, empowered by the Spirit of God, to obey and to do what the Word of God says? Like, I may not feel it, I may not understand it, I may not see it, but if that's what the Word of God says, then that's the way I'm going to live. But I think we have people all over the place on the map today just sort of we don't really want to line up with the Word. We want to line up with culture. We want to line up with Hollywood. We want to line up with what's cool or what's fun or what's profitable or, or, or whatever. But really the core of being a Pentecostal, and I would argue of being a Christian, is being in line with the Word of God. Don't let anybody push you into an experience that is out of line with the Word. Don't let anybody push you into a kind of place in your theology and your thinking that's out of line with the Word of God. We're, 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 we, we are uh, underneath the Word and the scrutiny of the Word. The next one is another one that you don't often see from a lot of, a lot of uh, folks in the church, and it's that we're called to purity. We're called to purity. Acts 2-3 says this, Divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each of them. Now, fire in the Scripture is a symbol of the power of the Lord, but it's also a symbol of His purification. It's also a symbol of His cleansing. I want you to notice that what He's saying to us here is we're not cleansed and made pure because we work so hard that we observe the law of Moses and, and we, we accomplish all that God wants us to, so we're pure enough and we get ourselves pure, and we make ourselves holy, and we, make our, we work, 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 and we get, our, we get everything right in our house, then the Holy Spirit will come into the home. Um, I kind of don't think how it, that's how it goes. I think the fire of God comes into the rubble and the tinder box of our lives and burns away the things that are unlike Him. And the fire and the passion of His Spirit are, are, are set us ablaze. And so we obey, and so we, so we live lives of purity, not because we're working hard to obey the law, but because we're empowered by the presence of the living God with a heart that is ablaze for His glory, that longs for Him like a deer pants for the streams of water. You and I don't want that naturally. But when the Holy Spirit empowers that supernaturally, He does something miraculous in our lives and He makes us better than we could ever be without Him. The next characteristic is that we're marked by diversity. From its very beginning, Pentecostalism has been marked by diversity. You know that revival I told you about on Azusa Street in California in 1914 or 1906, 114 years ago? Guess who led that revival? William Seymour, an African American preacher. And now Pentecost has swept over the entire world. 
But it wasn't just something new that happened on Azusa Street. When the, when the Spirit invaded that prayer meeting in the book of Acts, they began to speak in languages that they had never learned. Uh, the Scripture says this about that encounter in Acts chapter 2 and verse 6. Here's what the Scripture says. And at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. Now, if, if you read carefully and you look through verses 7 and 8 in that passage, you'll see that, the, 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 that Luke lists far-flung places from all over the empire. He said they were, they were from here and they were from there. and they're from all, You can look in verse 7 and 8 and you'll see just places, just names of places all over. That's where all these people were from. And they were hearing these languages not just in other, not just in other languages, but in dialect. Uh, that's like, you know, it's not just that they spoke English, but they spoke North Carolinian. <laughs> it's not just that they spoke North Carolinian, but they spoke Robesonian. Uh, I'm from Robeson County, and, and, you know, you can hear a Robesonian accent absolutely anywhere. I think I was in New York some time ago, and I was standing in line somewhere, and I heard somebody, two or three people back to me, uh, from me speaking, and I knew instantly, whoever, I didn't even see them, I just knew, they're from Robinson County, I can, I can hear it, I can hear it in their voice, and so I just, without even saying anything, I just turned around to them, and I just said, Lumberton or Pembroke, and <laughs> of course, it was, a, it was a fun conversation, but what happened on the day of Pentecost wasn't just that they spoke in other languages, but they spoke in the very dialect, the home language, the heart language of every one of those people who had come from all over the world. Now the question about that really is this, why? Maybe you've never thought about this, but the miracle of Pentecost really wasn't necessary. Let me explain what I mean. Everybody present there really were Jews. All Jews, no matter where they came from, knew Aramaic. So if you just simply wanted to communicate with everybody, you could speak in Aramaic. And not only that, but they almost certainly all knew Greek because Greek was the lingua franca of the day, just like English is today. I mean, I've lived in other parts of the world and, 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 and spent some time in foreign countries trying to learn languages. And sometimes, I have to tell you, it's difficult because everywhere you go, everybody wants to speak English. Not everywhere, but in a lot of places on earth. I spent time in Brussels and Belgium. I spent time in France. I spent time in, in, in Germany. And, and, and I was trying to learn those languages. And, and often I would find people and, and, and they, they would just speak to me in English. Their English was much better than my French or their English was much better than my German or whatever else. And, and, and so like English is, a, is a kind of a common language today. Even more so, Greek was kind of the, the common language in the ancient world. It, it was the lingua franca of the ancient world. So the question then is, why do you need to have other tongues so that, uh, so that the people are preaching the gospel in all of these different languages and all of these different dialects? And I present to you this, because I think God wants to speak to every person in their heart language. God wants to speak to every individual in the language that they hear best, that they know best, that they can receive the best. He calls people from every walk of life, from every nation, from every tribe, from every tongue, from every race, from every gender, from every age. He calls them all together into His people. And he speaks to each one of us. What an amazing God who speaks to every single individual one of us in the way that we can hear him speak. What a beautiful image of a father who speaks tenderly, individually to his children. He just doesn't call a family meeting and, and sit at the head of the table. He spends individual time 
with each and every one of us. It's another one of those reasons that we as a church have to demonstrate unity. Our nation is being torn apart by racial divisions. Our nation is being torn apart by political divisions. But not so in the church of the living God. Racism has no place in America, has no place in the capital church, has no place in the life of a believer. Gender discrimination has no place in the church, has no place in your family, has no place in your heart those good old boy jokes that you tell that tell that put others down or point the finger at somebody else has no place in the heart and the life of people who say they follow Jesus because Jesus intends to call people from absolutely every place on earth and if you don't like that kind of diversity you're not going to be too comfortable in heaven because the Bible tells me that when we get there when we arrive in heaven that people from every nation and tribe and tongue will be gathered there around the throne to worship Him forever together. So if you're not comfortable with that, then maybe you need to do some heart searching and figure out whether or not heaven is for you. I would say heaven is for you, and I would say that we need the transforming work in the Holy Spirit in our lives because the Holy Spirit calls us from every tribe, from every tongue, marked by that diversity. I think that ought to be the case in the local church. It ought to be the case in the global church. And I pray that we're moving towards that. Well, I could say so much more, but I want to just give you one more. If you've been counting, I've given you nine. And and, and just to be clear, I did not tell you from the beginning that I had ten characteristics. Because Preaching 101, rule number one, day one of the class is never tell people your sermon has 10 points, okay? Uh, I, you would have already turned me off and, and, <laughs> and you would have already lost your ability to pay attention. This is the last one, but I want you to pay special attention for us. It's, it's the most maybe theologically profound of all of them. Here's the last characteristic I want to share with you today about Pentecost and what it means, what it means that we're Pentecostal. Here's what it means. It means that we are weird. We're strange. Now, if that offends you, I want to tweak your understanding of what I'm talking about. What I mean is, there is something strange about living by faith. Strange from the perspective of this world. From one point of view, there is something strange and unusual about encountering the Holy Spirit. Something really strange about the gift of of speaking in tongues. Um, Something strange about the manifestation of the presence of the Lord. When I was a teenager, I remember (laughs) inviting people to come to my church. And and, and, and I I went to kind of a small little sort of country uh, Pentecostal church that was unashamedly, unavowedly Pentecostal. I mean, it was Pentecostal. I mean, old school Pentecostal. And sister so-and-so would shout her hair down and brother so-and-so would, would sling his watch off and sister so-and-so would, would, would lay in the altar and weep and somebody else, I mean, it was Pentecost, it was, it was something else. And I would invite people to come with me and I would sometimes just sit and pray, oh Lord, please don't let sister so-and-so get in the spirit today. Oh God, please no. And I would see sister so-and-so and she'd start to shake her head and I knew what was about to happen and I just looked at my Baptist friend beside me or my unsaved friend beside me and I saw sister so-and-so and I thought, oh dear God, what's about to happen? And I remember just being, just being embarrassed by those things at certain points. But I, I do want to say very somberly to you that we, we ought to expect that the work of the Spirit of God should seem unusual to the people of this world. Paul instructed us, don't scoff at the gift of tongues. I mean, Paul himself said in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 18, he said, I speak in tongues more than all of you. Uh, later on in that same chapter, he said, don't forbid speaking in tongues. I mean, the Corinthian church was the one church that messed it all up. They were focusing on all the wrong things. It was charismania gone wild. But to them, Paul didn't say, stop this charismaniac stuff. He didn't say that. What he said was, hey, I speak in tongues more than all of you. Don't forbid speaking in tongues. But here's what he did teach them. He said, keep those gifts in their proper perspective. 
You're not better than somebody else because you speak in tongues or worse than somebody else because you don't. And speaking in tongues is not the litmus test for your spirituality. That's where some people go desperately wrong. They feel like if they speak in tongues or if they, if they have some, they want to prophesy or they have some kind of spiritual gift in their life that they're more spiritual than someone else. Well, your spiritual gift is not the litmus test for your spirituality. The litmus test for your spirituality is the fruit of the Spirit in your life. So we focus our attention, we focus ourselves on the appropriate perspective. Every gift should be in its appropriate perspective. The gift itself is never, ever the focus. It's not designed to draw attention to itself. In fact, I, I would say Pentecost is not meant to excite us. It's meant to expel us. It meant, it's meant to explode us into the world. It's meant to exponentially increase God's work and ministry through us. It's not meant to excite us. It does excite us, but that's not the goal. The goal is not just so we come together and, 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 and have goosebumps or, or Holy Spirit bumps or whatever you want to call it. It's not just so we come together and have that emotional high. Those things do happen when we come together. It is exciting. And, and I'm telling you, when we gather back in our buildings, we are going, to, we're, it's going to be exciting. It's going to be like, it's going to be like a lifetime of Easter's rolled into one. I, I can't wait until we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus together in our buildings together. But until that time, the church is not closed and you still have an opportunity to encounter the presence of the Lord and to encounter your own personal Pentecost. We need His strange, unusual, life-giving power now more than we have ever needed Him before, possibly in our entire lives. You need the power of Pentecost. I'm not ashamed of the power of Pentecost because for me, the power of Pentecost is right at the heart of what the New Testament teaches. It's not about some crazy, peripheral, kooky, uh, weirdo <laughs> doctrine. It's about a continuation of the ministry of Jesus that granted can seem rather weird when we're limited in our perspective or limited to this world's view on things. But God gives us His Spirit and He gives us His life and He gives us His presence. Not just to excite us, it certainly does but to expel us and to expand us and to explode in us and in influence and power and blessing. And that's why my prayer for you is that wherever you are in your spiritual journey, that before all is said and done, you will experience your own personal encounter with the Holy Spirit. If you have any interest at all in what I'm talking about, if you have any tug on your heart at all to, to, to have an encounter with the Lord, wherever you are in your spiritual journey, may, maybe you haven't even yet professed faith in Jesus. Maybe, maybe you're just exploring that and you're just listening, trying to figure out what all this means and whether it's for you. Or maybe you've been walking with Jesus for years. Wherever you are in your spiritual journey, I think the Holy Spirit, if you're listening to me right now, I think it's because the Holy Spirit is drawing you closer, calling you deeper in, inviting you to greater experience in Him, through Him, of Him, from Him. And I pray that you would open yourself to receive everything that God has for you. If you're far from Him, now's the time to invite Him to come. If you've been walking with Him for some time, Now's the time to seek Him for more. Not just for our excitement, but for our expansion, our, 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 our explosion in a positive way of what God wants to do. Will you pray with me about that together? Father, in the name of Jesus, for the one who's far from you right now, I ask that you help that one to open their heart to you and to invite you to come in. I pray, Lord, that that one who knows that, that they're, they're, they're distant from you, they're estranged from you, they know 
There's, they just have not given their lives to you. They, they, they just haven't surrendered to you. Lord, that one, I pray, you would, you would cause them right now to open their experience to you. If that's you right now, maybe you could just say, Jesus, come into my experience. Jesus, give me your forgiveness. Give me your peace. I want that encounter with your life. Help me to find that in Jesus' name. Maybe if you've been walking some time with the Lord, maybe you could just say, Lord, right now, give me more of your spirit than I've ever known before. Take me deeper in the river than I have ever waded. Fill me more full than I have ever been. Increase my capacity to receive the fullness of the Spirit that you want to live within me. And these things we receive according to the promise of the Father. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen and Amen. I pray that message was a blessing to you. If it was, I pray you would share it with someone and let someone know what God is doing in your life. Hey, if God just did something new in you, we want to hear about it. We want to know about it because we want to help you take the next steps of faith. So I would just urge you to let us know. Contact the church office. Let us know right there in the church online platform or in Facebook Live or wherever you're watching. Communicate with us. Let us know you took a step of faith today. We want to pray with you and help you along the journey. We can't wait till we get to see you in person. Until then, may God richly bless you. We love you. We're praying for you. And we can't wait to see you next time. Wow, what a powerful message on what can happen when we encounter God through the continual ministry of Jesus through Pentecost. If you just pray that prayer and if you're looking for your next steps, hey, we want to help you in your next steps journey of faith. You can go to our website at thecapitalchurch.org slash next steps so that we can help you in this brand new journey with Jesus Christ. If you aren't connected to a small group, we would encourage you to join one of our virtual groups by going to our website at thecapitalchurch.org slash groups. Hey, well, thank you all so much for being here. We are looking forward to when we can meet again at our physical location. But until then, have an awesome and blessed week.